they want to attack me back. And because, you know, they might see me dressed up or bit makeup and they think the quickest and easiest way to hurt her back is to say something about her appearance. Is an assumption a cover for a trigger that's not been healed? Absolutely. Yeah. So can you, can you explain why that is the case? Well, the thing is, I would imagine if they are assuming that I'm like this and I'm a terrible person and I'm hideous, all right, what it does is then it invalidates my message to them and then they don't have to work on what I'm talking about. So this, so this happens in business, in life, in every, every, every factor and every... Everything. It happens, yeah. Because here's the thing. People talk a lot about pretty privilege. And they'll say to, so stuff like, oh, yeah, but, you, you know, pretty privilege. And you just, you know, that's why you're, you only go... You've only had this level of success because of your pretty... But it actually works massively against you. In this particular field, if I was an influencer selling makeup products, absolutely pretty privilege matters. But in an academic sense, it's been nothing but a hindrance. In schools, in uh, when I was educating, everything when I was doing my qualifications, I found uh, like if if you even take some pride in your appearance, people automatically assume you're dumb, and then you have to work double hard to kind of uh, get that respect. And I found it with students as well. I'd walk into a classroom and immediately they were like, oh, she's going to be shit. Oh, she's... And then they'd give me that resistance and I'd have to extra prove myself to just get the normal baseline level of... Did that add wounds to you as a psychologist that you then had to overcome? What it did for me is it made me very self-deprecating. So anyone who knows me knows that within five minutes I'll say an insult to myself. I'm so stupid. I'm so dumb. I'm so oh, I'm so fat. I'll say... You stupid. did it before the podcast. Did I? It? What did I say? You, you were... You were not not in not in the sense of uh, in the way that you've just explained but in the sense of like when we're talking about cameras and stuff and you yeah. you, you, you apologize and you and you're apologizing for things you don't need to apologize for yeah overly ob- i'm so self-deprecating i'm overly apologetic because i was constantly criticized in my field because i because i i you know taking care of your appearance and then going into schools would automatically especially with the female students put them on guard anything i would say to them they would take it negatively because they would assume it's coming from a place of arrogance so i had to self-deprecate to get their to get their alliance i'd have to say oh i'm so ugly oh i'm so stupid oh i'm so this um, and only through putting myself down would i get their warmth so i got into the habit of doing that do you, you know, with friend groups and like groups of girls, groups of guys, do you see, let's, let's just say, for, let's just take, for instance, a group of girls that are mm. together. Do you find that there's a lot of crabs in a bucket mentality within these groups these days that hold the someone that wants to break out of a pattern back? So to speak? Yeah, do you know what? I, I, I find that, especially in London, I experience that. What happens in London, in, in Dubai, the sky is the limit. You can literally be a CEO of a top company and, you know, everybody can. So there's no holding each other back as much. But in London, there is a glass ceiling, whether it's due to structural racism, whether it's due to, you know, some, uh, like where you come from, your background, whatever, there's some glass ceiling. So what happens is people really put down your efforts to overachieve or to get out of there. And I understand sometimes some people can be a bit delusional and you just want to give them a reality check. But even if it's as small as like traveling a lot, things that are so achievable, they want to put you down but why don't you just save your money why are you always out all the time why do you always go for dinner they just have to question your happiness and it's a strange it's a strange mentality there's a lot of podcasters out there at the moment that are talking about masculinity Mm -hmm. at scale one one podcast in america that i know is called fresh and fit Uh and there's these two on there one of them is called myron i think and they preach being high value men Mm -hmm. and from the outside looking in on a personal level I, i'm like i don't find them as high value as sometimes as what they say they are yeah because of the positioning with the women that they're with exactly because right? i because so are these men high value from a psychological point of view Hi, or, yeah. or, or or what's or what's the go with that and, and why is society rewarding this i i feel like what's actually that culture is a bunch of men who've been rejected in their past don't have a lot of success with women and are now punishing women through the use of money now now that they made a bit of money now they can punish them and embarrass them on their platform but the reality is here here's this this is what high value men truly are your high value is determined by the level of woman you can get to submit to you 
That's your value. The highest level of woman that you can get to submit to you. Now, if the highest level of woman you can get to a, like kind of submit and look after and be loyal to you is an uh, is a stripper or is like they usually get a lot of OnlyFans models. So that's the highest level of woman you can get to be loyal to you. You're not high value. But if you can get a woman who is up there, has plenty of options, and is inaccessible, highly loyal, if you can get that woman to submit to you, that's when you're high level. So if you want to know whether you're a high value man, look at the highest level of women you can get to totally be loyal to you. And if it's low, you're not that high value. And the other thing that they do that I find really bizarre is they take low value women and kind of like speak to them badly and teach men to disrespect their woman, like to kind of be rude to them and, and not give them too much and give them less. But the, this was what truly high value men do. They pick wisely. They pick super, super wisely. They're highly selective with the women that they choose. And then when they've chosen her correctly, they spoil her endlessly. They put her through the ringers. It's like, you know, when you go to six, seven rounds of an interview to get into those corporate jobs, they make you go through interview after interview after interview, a bit like going to a Harvard application. When you get to Harvard, they treat you well. Your life is set. But up until that point, they put you through it. What Fresh and Fit teach is take any kind of woman and then don't give her too much, play games, treat her harshly. That's not what high value men do. They've got a reputation. They can't just take any old girl and then try and train her. They ain't got time for that. They take a woman who's been well trained by her family. That's amazing. Like, I've never seen it from that perspective before. Like well, well trained by her family. I mean, that's your that, that's, gonna, that's gonna that's gonna get a lot of a lot of people's backs up. Especially some. So obviously, there might be some women that listen to this that might not have had a dad. And yeah, and like the dad might not be, been around. Yeah. And I've noticed that from my own dating life that if I've dated a girl with who's who's come from a and I don't mean this in a disrespectful way, yeah. it's like a it's like a broken, broken home, home. Yeah. and and the dad's been absent for periods of time, the, the level of trauma that that girl's got in her yeah. life has made it more difficult and has brought up triggers within me Absolutely. from my childhood. Absolutely. So how? Does that affect a woman then, not for them not having a father? Here's the thing. What a lot of men and women do, when they have an absent father, they remove the pain of it by destroying his reputation, by saying, I hate him. He was a prick. He was this. He was that. Fine. He might be Ted Bundy. He might be the worst person on the planet. It doesn't change the fact that you needed two parents growing up. And the lack of one parent is still traumatic. So how they defend themselves is by saying they didn't need their dad. They don't care about their dad. No worries, no one's suggesting that you did, but it still causes a trauma in a child. And the trauma, you only, you only realise the trauma mostly when they try and get into relationships. And there's a level of fear of abandonment that you can't, you can't set, soothe them with. Sometimes you just can't soothe them. They just might be overly anxious that you're going to leave them. They might be overly independent and think, I don't need you because you might leave at any point. They might be uh, easily triggered. And you're thinking, I'm doing my best. What's wrong with her? Why won't she calm down? Children need two parents. And when they don't have that, they don't regulate their emotions correctly as an adult. And it's hyper-triggered when they're in a relationship and they're finally in love.